modern applications. What are they and why are customers adopting this new approach? That's going to be something that it would help to understand. So when you're looking at um, the various different types of applications we use and have used, I'm going to say historically over time, we can go way back. Some of us go all the way back to the mainframe era, right? Hopefully, we've mostly forgotten uh, what those applications look like, green screens and PF keys and all that fun stuff. And most of us are probably still very familiar with client server type of applications, some type of fat client that we're running on our computer talking to a server sitting somewhere. Then evolution wise, we've kind of shifted over to the middleware portion where people are writing applications, but they're using some additional, let's say, software in the middle to help those applications run. Things may be like they need a, um, a Tomcat server, or maybe they need an Apache server sitting in the middle inside there, some libraries that they're using, some extension or framework that's going on. Now, this is where probably the majority of the customer's applications are sitting at today. Some of them have started, you know, the migration over to microservices. When we look at where they're at today, when we're looking at this client server piece, we do have our virtualization playing inside that space. When it comes to running the server that the client's talking to, those servers are, are not typically running bare metal. They're running as a virtual machine on top of our virtualization platform, vSphere, vSAN, maybe NSX even, that's doing some protection for them. Middleware, almost all of that is using the same stack, virtualization. They're running their software-defined data center. They're you know, buying the, you know, the hyper-converged vSAN, et cetera. But they're finding out some of the benefits they got in, in developing underneath this new middleware paradigm. They can take that one more couple of steps, and they're going to start moving stuff over here to microservices. And the question in your mind's got to be is, why? Is, is this not working on what we have today? And the answer is, no, it's not. What's happening is the way that things are being um, designed, developed, deployed, tested, et cetera, it's not fast enough. And there's a piece that you could see that's going on today when we talk about speed and when we say velocity, what we're talking about is how quickly can they get updates out, new features are getting added in. And they're not able to do it fast enough. And I'm going to give you a picture to show to help you understand the why they can't do it fast enough. The challenge for them is, one, if they can't go at the speed that they want to, potentially they're missing out on market opportunities of being able to, one, release a new application, update and enhance their existing application. So the outcome that they're looking for is they want to be able to do stuff in weeks and not months. Some customers, if you talk to them about how often they're releasing a new version of a piece of their software, some of them it could be monthly, quarterly. Okay, I, I remember some applications, they, there, there'd be two updates a year. Well, if you think about your phone today and you go into your app store, how often are you getting updates on those applications? I don't know about you, but I open up my phone in the morning and it's like, oh, here's another 10, 20, 30 updates that I need for various applications. And some of those apps are getting updated maybe two, three times a week. What they have currently today in place has a high amount of technical debt and high operational costs. It's costing them labor and effort to maintain what they have in place. And if they even did want to move it somewhere else, the way that, that those applications are constructed, it's very hard to make some type of fundamental change to get the applications to a new platform to be able to run them. 
So what they're doing is they're introducing containers, microservices, and APIs into their application stack so that they can get the agility and velocity that they want. So in a lot of these cases here, they're taking their old monolithic applications, client server, or middleware style applications. They're refactoring them into containerized workloads that's giving them the velocity that they need to be able to get to market sooner. So to help you understand what's going on, in this particular slide, we're kind of giving you a little bit of the same type of historical thing that is typically happening. In you know, the years earlier, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago and before, if you wanted to bring out a some application and you were working on the application team to say, hey, we're going to release this new, you know, great application, basically you had to deal with setting everything up. You had to deal with how are you going to do networking to your application? And I mean, all the way from start to finish, you had to worry about provisioning servers, storage, um, potentially virtualization. You had to install the appropriate OS on it, middleware. All this was your responsibility when you're building out a new application. In order to do that, real simple, time and labor and effort to do it. Okay. It took more time to do it. And a lot of times, a lot of different groups were involved to be able to do that. We evolved and we went over here to the client server middleware style. Now, this is where we've got hopefully our vSphere environment in place and already running, right? So we have our infrastructure as a service. Customers are already familiar with that. They love it. It's, you know, gosh, this is so much better than what we used to have. But now, if I'm somebody trying to get an application out, you notice I've got less pieces that I have to deal with. Now, this could be a team of us. It could be um, depending on how the customers, you know, uh, their departments are constructed. Maybe somebody says, well, listen, I'll get the operating system and the VM created for you. And then I'm going to turn it over to you, Mr. Application Developer. And you have to deal with all the other stuff you've got to install inside your VM. So the, maybe the developer would deal with installing the middleware, the runtime environment, handling how they're going to connect to the data and put their applications in. Better than this, right? I mean, this is certainly better than Heritage IT, but as you can see, there's still a lot of moving pieces. So when we come over to our last section over here, microservices in cloud native, the developers are saying, hey, I can do stuff faster. I could fix things, create things, deploy things faster because what are they dealing with? They're only having to deal with the last two little sections inside there, getting their application containerized and getting connectivity to their data. So you could clearly see there's better velocity inside this. In order to understand the difference of what a container is, it kind of helps to go backwards and talk a little bit about what's a virtual machine. When you think about a virtual machine, what is a virtual machine? Well. That's one of those constructs that we're putting on top of an ESX hypervisor that's running this VM, but what is it? Well, it starts first with some type of guest operating system that the customer's saying they want inside this VM. So maybe they put a Windows server, or maybe they put an Ubuntu server, or a Photon that they put inside their guest OS. Then they built the VM for a purpose. What's the purpose? Maybe they want to run an application. So they're going to install application dependencies that the developer tells them their app needs. And then in turn, they install the application on top of those application dependencies. And then they start things up and, you know, cross your fingers, pray, everything's good. Boom, my application is working. My VM now encompasses all this stuff. Yes, it's portable. We can vMotion it. Um, you know, we could back it up. We can disaster recovery it somewhere else. It's much better than the way we had it with Heritage IT. However, containers are the next evolution. And what a container starts with is it starts on the stuff that runs on top of the guest OS. And this box here 
represents my container. It's just my application in my application dependencies that it needs. And that's what the developer's building. They're not having to deal with that underlying guest OS. So the container encapsulate is, as I said, the application and the associated application dependencies. And they are truly ultra portable. Versus a VM, I can't move a VM from a vSphere environment, let's say, over to a Hyper-V environment. Yes, there's tools that allow me to export it and import it, but no, it's not just a straight move it over. Containers are. I could run a container on any Kubernetes guest OS platform, and it will run there regardless if it's a Tanzu or a direct AWS or a GCP a Kubernetes cluster. That container that I've developed is going to be able to run anywhere, provided we have the same operating system kernel sitting down at the bottom. So why don't we just stop there? This container thing sounds like it's absolutely awesome. It's a great thing. I've gotten to where I need to do. I've got ultra portable. My application can run anywhere. It sounds absolutely wonderful. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is containers using something like Docker are managed on a single container host. The problem is when we start to defining multiple container hosts, we've got these problems that suddenly get introduced. And I want you to think about this. It's kind of like running a vSphere environment with one ESX host. Well, that's not going to work real well. What happens if I have more you know, workload than one physical server can support? I need multiple ESX hosts. The same things in our Kubernetes containerized world, you're going to need multiple container hosts. And when you start getting multiple container hosts running, the problem is, is how do you manage a larger number of containers that are running across their data center or even across their cloud environment? What happens if your container fails? Docker by himself does not restart a failed container. Kubernetes does. How do I get my containers to scale to meet my capacity? If, you know, it's, it's, let's say, the Christmas season and it's shopping time, everybody's, you know, hitting, you know, your shopping cart application. Oh my gosh, everything's slowing down. What do I need to do? I could have instructed Kubernetes to auto scale my application so that as I see the container starting to hit, let's say, 70% utilization, I could have Kubernetes say, hey, when you start peaking at 70% CPU utilization, create another one, auto scale it. That's built inside Kubernetes. Kubernetes has uh, um, better ways to do networking and load balancing because you're going to need that inside your new microservices application. Kubernetes has tools to help me automatically upgrade my application. I released my shopping cart. It's version 1.1. People found some bugs. I've got 1.2 that I want to be able to release. Kubernetes has tools will, that will help me automate the release of that new version. He has a framework that gives me stateful storage. He has tools to help me do security. So Kubernetes is this orchestration layer that solves all these issues. So hopefully this is giving you a pretty good idea of what is this new modern application world and a little bit of a depth to help you understand what is the Tanzu portfolio. Mm -hmm.